شيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها المزم قم الليل إلا قليلا نصفه أو انقص منه قليلا أو زد عليه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا إنا سنلقي عليك قولا ثقيلا إن ناشئة الليل هي أشد وطأ هي أشد وطأ وأقوى مقيلا إن لك في النهار سبحا طويلا فاذكر اسم ربك وتبت إليه تبتيلا رب المشرق والمغرب لا إله إلا هو لا إله إلا هو فد تخذه وكيلا بسم الله الرحمن Many. And today we are looking at a quality of the Prophet ﷺ that's very difficult to discuss and very hard to teach because it weighs very heavily on a person's shoulders, this particular subject, this particular quality. And it is the quality of the Prophet ﷺ's worship, his spirituality, his closeness to Allah, his fear of Allah. Believe me, you don't want to be sitting on this chair today. One can never talk about this subject without feeling so guilty, so inadequate, so far from being even deserving to even speak about the subject. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me and forgive all of us. The verses I recited in the beginning, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, according to very many scholars, was the third set of verses ever to be revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. Nothing was obligatory for any Muslim at this time. But for the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he had one obligation. He did not have to fast, he did not have to pay zakah, he did not have to go for the major pilgrimage or the minor pilgrimage, the hajj or umrah. None of these things were obligatory. He did not have to pray five times a day, nor four, nor three. There was only one thing obligatory for him, which was to pray the night prayer, to pray Qiyam al It was obligatory on him in the first eight to nine years of his mission. But why did Allah make it obligatory on him to pray the night prayer? Why not the rest of the day? Why not the five prayers? Why not one prayer in the daytime? Yes. It's the time you are closest to Allah. Can anybody find me an ayah that says that the night prayer 
is better than praying the day. I may have recited it in the beginning. Inna nashi'at al-layli hiya ashaddu wata'an wa aqwa muqila. Allah says in Surah Al-Muzzammil, Muzzammil in Arabic literally, Zammala yuzammilu, to wrap something up. Allah refers to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by saying, O oh, you who is wrapped up, and this is something important to note. In the Quran, Allah never says, Ya Muhammad. Allah never calls him by his name. In many traditional cultures, maybe I'm from South Asia, maybe some Arab cultures, maybe some African cultures. In some cultures, a wife does not call her name, husband by his first name. Out of respect. And so in, in some cultures, human cultures, this has developed. But I want to point out one thing. Allah never calls the Prophet ﷺ by his first name. But he calls all the other Prophets by their first name. Ya Adam, uskun anta wa al jannah. O Adam, you and your wife stay in paradise. Ya Nuh, ihbit bi salamin minna. O Nuh, land, have a safe landing and with a peaceful landing. Ya Yahya, Khudil kitaba bi quwa. O Yahya, take the revelation with strength. But he never says, Ya Muhammad. He says, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi. O Messenger. Ya Ayyuhan Rasul. O Prophet. Ya Ayyuhan Muzzammil. O he who is wrapped up. Such respect, such reverence over any other Prophet that he won't even call him by his name. He calls him by his title. He calls him by his state of being. O oh, you who is wrapped up. قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Pray at night, but for a little. نِصْفَهُ Half of it. أَوْ إِنْقُسْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا Or pray a little less than the half, half of the night. أَوْ زِدَ عَلَيْهِ Allah says pray half the night. Less or more, it doesn't matter. This is one thing we're going to really tease out today from across all of the descriptions of the Prophet's, the prophet's worship and his closest to Allah. أَوْ زِدَ عَلَيْهِ more than half, fine. Less than half, fine. But what's the most important thing Allah wants the Prophet to do at night? وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Make sure you do one thing, O Muhammad Wasallam. Make sure you recite the Qur'an with a slow melody. Take your time with the Qur'an. Don't be in a rush. The time you spend in prayer doesn't matter. What is more important to me, O Muhammad, is that you take your time with the Qur'an. وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Why? Why doesn't the time, the quantity matter, the pages, the number of verses? Then Allah explains. إِنَّا سَنُلْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا we, What I'm sending down to you is a heavy word. It's not something you can run through. It's something very heavy. Sometimes there are some books you read you think you could read 50 pages a day, but you, you read the first page and you read it again and you read it again and it didn't digest. It's deep. So you don't want to go to the next page. The Quran is like that. They're heavy words, deep meanings, complex concepts. You can't race through. Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ, the most important thing, this is a heavy word, so take your time with it. Enjoy it. Let taste the sweetness of it. Don't be in a rush. وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا If there ever was a starting point to understand the Prophet ﷺ's closeness to Allah, where did it come from? How was it expressed? How can we embody it in our lives? These are the three questions. We would have to start at one starting point, which is the night prayer. And this is the first principle for all of us if you want to write it down, write it down. You need private quality time with Allah every day. We all need private quality time with Allah. We need time, even if it's five minutes, time for you to talk to Allah. Time for Allah to talk to you. Non-negotiable time. If you don't do this, my day is incomplete. I feel an emptiness in my chest. I feel a sense of anxiety. I can't move on with my day. I haven't had my breakfast, my spiritual breakfast. This is, this is really important. 
a day that is, does not have this private time with Allah, al khalwatu ma Allah, is an empty day, spiritually empty day. You will feel numb. The days you spend like this will slowly catch up to you until one day you crash and burn. You suddenly you miss a salah, an obligatory salah. You snap at your parents. You scam someone in a transaction. You think, how did I get here? Me, I'm such a, you know, I'm such a pious person. I'm so righteous. How did I end up breaking a rule? It's because the day is collected. It accumulated. The rust on the heart accumulated until the heart became numb. When the heart is numb, you can commit any crime because you will feel nothing. And so this is a non-negotiable. Every day there must be time for you and Allah. It could be the night prayer. It could be five minutes when you're at work, you turn off, it's in your calendar, turn off the monitor, look down and say, La ilaha illallah ten times. It could be a moment, it could be a minute, one golden minute in the day, but no one can escape that you need a non-negotiable moment every day, five minutes, ten minutes, one hour. You need your time with Allah. For the Prophet ﷺ, there were two times in the day that he would have khalwa, he would have a solitude, time to himself, away from all distractions, away from all notifications, all people with Allah. The first is the night prayer. And the second, after Fajr. Wa Quran al Fajr. Allah says the recitation at Fajr. Inna Quran al Fajr kana mashhuda. That morning time, that pure time in the morning, is witnessed by the angels. If he had people to visit, funerals to attend, old, old people to serve, an army to manage and organize, all of this would happen after Fajr. But that Fajr time, don't disturb me, don't come to me, don't call me, don't message me, don't. This is my time with Allah, this one hour. And my whole day is determined by how this hour is spent. This is how the Prophet's mindset was, sallallahu alayhi wa I want to zoom into two instances in which the Prophet ﷺ was having this time with Allah, this private time with Allah. You might think, okay, I blocked my calendar 30 minutes, let's say after Isha, or 30 minutes before Fajr. Or after, I blocked my calendar, this is my time with Allah, now what do I do? I want to give you three incidents from the Prophet's life, a snapshot. Someone took a picture, or took a small video while he was in this moment. What was he doing? The first one. One day Bilal radiallahu anhu enters the house of the Prophet before Fajr, before the morning prayer. And he finds him reciting the Quran in the night prayer. He finds that he's crying so much, it's like someone poured a bucket of water on his head. And after the salah, he asks him, O Prophet of Allah, what led you to cry so much? I've never seen you sob this much before. The Prophet says to him, do you know Bilal, what Allah revealed to me tonight? Allah revealed to me verses from Surah Ali Imran. Inna fi khalqis samawati wal ard. In the creation of the heavens and the earth. Wa khtilaf al layli wal nahar. And in the alternation of night and day. La ayatin li ulil al bab. There are signs for people who think. These verses the Prophet ﷺ did not race through them. He spent time with them. He contemplated them until they moved him to tears until the tears took over his body. This moment is recorded until the end of time. It will be a timeless memory that it is not about how many pages you recited, but it is about how many tears you shed. It is not about how quickly you finished, but it is about how deeply the impact was felt of those verses. The second incident, and perhaps the most impactful incident in this context here, of the night prayer of the Prophet Aisha radiallahu anha tells us, one night the Prophet recited one ayah, again and again and again and again, the entire night. Imagine now, the night Isha comes in at eight, and imagine Fajr is at five, and imagine for eight hours, eight hours, he stood reciting one ayah. I challenge you to try it for 20 minutes, you'll get bored. What, what kind of a person does he need to be to enjoy one ayah for eight hours? 
There are people here, they watch a cartoon, they watch a movie. If you say, can we watch it again? They say, oh my God, don't bore me, please. Again, I've already seen it. I know what's going to happen. Somebody's watched a match. You say, can you watch the highlights together? Oh my God, I've already seen it. I know what's going to happen. What does it take to taste the verses fresh again and again? And more interestingly, what was the verse that he was reciting? He recited this verse. Oh Allah, if you punish them, they are your slaves. You can do so. But oh Allah, if you forgive them, then you are the mighty and you are the authority. This ayah, he recited it again and again and again. All night. Why? Because of the impact it had. Clearly for him, the night prayer was not about quantity, but it was about the quality. Clearly it was about the contemplation. It was not about the race to finish. And he tasted these verses. And he would make dua between verses. When he would stop at a verse that described paradise, he would pause. He would say, oh Allah, make us of the people of paradise. And when he would recite a verse of hellfire, he would pause. And he would say, oh Allah, protect me from the hellfire. The sign of a prophetic prayer is not how much you recited, but how much you stopped. It's not about how much you recited, but how little you recited. It's not about how quick the rak'ah was, but how slow it was. It is not about the length of your thawb, but how far your tears dripped onto the carpet. The third situation. The Prophet ﷺ is praying at night until his feet became swollen. And Aisha asks him, why would you do this? Why do you pray for so long until your feet are swollen when your previous and future sins are forgiven? You have no need to do this, basically. And he says, How can I not be grateful to Allah? Every car has an engine. Every airplane. If you look at a big Boeing, the big air inside, there's something moving it, making it move. Something giving it speed, rotation. Something giving it that horsepower. This, if we say the Prophet sallallahu if you look at his worship, it looks like a, like a jet, like a speeding jet. Look how far he's going. Look how much mile he covers. But what was the engine that moved him? What was the muharrik? What was inside him? It was this feeling of being indebted to Allah. How much Allah has given me, yet how little I show. What we realize from this hadith of Aisha, the greatest worship of the Prophet ﷺ was not his bodily worship. It was the worship of the heart. Whatever you saw outside, inside something far greater was happening. Whatever on the outside you saw of his ruku' and his standing and his sujood, the level of gratitude to Allah in his heart was far outstripped what you saw on the outside. It, the outside could not show you the depth of gratitude, the depth of shame he had from Allah, the depth of love of Allah, the depth of fear of Allah in his heart. You could never know how deep it was. You only got the iceberg, you only got the tip of the iceberg on the outside of the Prophet. And therefore, for most of us, for many of us. It is not that we don't pray salah on time, or that we don't pray salah often enough. It is not that we don't care about the night prayer. It is that deep down, we do not have the same feelings towards Allah. The feeling of love, the feeling of fear, the feeling of indebtedness, of shame, the feeling of gratitude, that doesn't exist in the heart. If the engine is not working, the plane will not fly. If a camel doesn't have food, it will not walk. This is the nourishment of the heart. Those emotions. If those emotions are not there, the outer worship is going to be empty. And this is what made the Prophet Sallallahu worship greater than the worship of any man on this earth. He made the same movements. Arguably some companions of the Prophet would go further than him. They would stand up for longer. They would fast more days. They would give more in charity, more quantity. But they could never match the depth of feeling in his heart. And so if you want to compete, 
Don't compete on quantity, but compete in depth and quality. This is what the Prophet ﷺ teaches. أَفَلَا أَكُونَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا What moves you to worship is greater than the worship itself. The intention is greater than the action. What is in the heart is greater than what is on the limbs. One day, three men come to the Prophet ﷺ. One of them says to him, إِنِّي أَصُمُ وَلَا أُفْطِرُ I will fast every day. I will never have a day where I don't fast. One man comes to him. He says, "Ana la atazawajun nisa." I will never get married. I will live celibate. And a third man comes and he says, "Ana la akuru laham." I will never eat meat. This third man today he has a big following. It's called veganism. Our good friends, the vegans and the vegetarians, they say veganism is the sunnah. I'll tell you now what's the sunnah, don't worry. The Prophet ﷺ looks at these three men. What are they trying to do? These three men. Their understanding of the Prophet's worship, they're trying to follow the sunnah, right? But where did they go wrong? Is there anything wrong with fasting? Is there anything wrong? Where did they go wrong? Yes. Hmm? They tried to do more than the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, uncle? They went to an extreme. Yes? They pick quantity over quality. Yes. They were trying to be in a competition with the Prophet. Is that is that a competition you can win? No, definitely not. So so these three men they came to the Prophet. They misunderstood. Now I'm going to give you another example after this. Somebody who understood what it really meant to worship Allah. But these three men, they thought it's about quantity. It's about fasting every day of the year. And they went to an extreme. And the Prophet ﷺ says to them, Ana a'lamukum billahi wa atqakum. I am the most God-fearing of you. And I am the most knowledgeable of Allah amongst you. Wa asumu wa uftir. I fast some days, some days I don't fast. Wa atazawwaju nisa. And I marry women. And I eat meat. And in another narration he says, and I love women and I love perfume. I have interests, I have hobbies, I am a human being. I, it's not wrong to have this part of you. Let's take an example. How many days a month did the Prophet ﷺ fast, for example? Okay, you're saying the white days. How many days is that in the month? Three days. Mondays and Thursdays. How many days is it in a month is that? Eight days. What's eight plus three? 83, right? <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on, you don't... I don't know. I love De definitely, you guys are falling asleep. It's warm in this room. Definitely. 8 plus 3 is 11. So he would fast 11 days a month. That's roughly one third of the month. Right? Any other days he would fast? Sorry? Okay. They are, they are let's say, seasons of worship. Intense worship. In those seasons of intense worship, it is about quantity. It's about intensity. So he fasts all 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. He would fast in the sacred months, Al Ashurul Hurum. He would fast more than he would fast in other months. And there is a month, he would almost fast the entire month the month of Sha'ban. The month before Ramadan, the month of Sha'ban, he would fast almost the entire month in preparation for Ramadan. So there are months in which he would be, it would be more intense and there were months in which he would be less intense. But on average, 11 days a month. What's he saying to us? He's saying to us, you can fast 22 days if you want. But if you want to get on my level, it's not about quantity. But fast like my fast. Often, we miss the whole point of the Prophet ﷺ's sunnah. He says, Sallu kama ra'aytu muni usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. How do we interpret it? Did he put his hands here? Or here? Or here? Or here? Or here? Or here? Or here? Where did he put his hands? This is a part of salah. But we miss the core of salah. When he said, pray as you have seen me pray. Did you see him pray for six hours straight? Did you see, him, did you see his ruku'ah? Did you see his khushu'ah? 
Did you see his focus, his humility, his intensity, his weeping in sujood? Did you see his long dua? Did you see his rukur, which was as long as his standing? Did you see him recite Surah Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran and Nisa in one prayer? Did you see that? That's the prayer we should be emulating. But we got lost in the detail, the finer detail, and we missed the big picture. Missed the big picture completely. It's like somebody goes to buy a car. I'm sorry for the car example. I'm selling my car. So <laughs> someone goes to buy a car. And you go and you check the mirrors and you, you open the bonnet and look inside and you check whether the buttons are working to get the windows up and down. And you say, yes, I'm going to take the car. And the car has no tires. How is it going to move? You missed you miss the whole point. You got all the details and you missed the point. This is how we do with salah. Sallu kama Yes, the outward prayer is important, but he never told a person, he never condemned a person's salah except when their inward salah was deficient. Somebody came to the masjid. He prayed salah. He did all the movements and he left. The Prophet said, stop, you didn't pray, go back and pray. Three times. His outward salah was fine, it was perfect. What was he missing? At-tuma'nina. The slowness of prayer. The peace of salah. It is as though he didn't pray. This is the Prophet he keeps pointing to this, guys, don't miss the point. It's not about the movements. Don't come and peck on the floor like a chicken. He, he described the salah of a hypocrite. A hypocrite waits until the end of time and then he quickly pecks four times on the ground like a chicken. And he goes, that's his salah. Tilka salatul munafiq, he says. That is a salah of a fake believer. This is, the, this is the description of our salah, many of us. If you want to get started emulating the salah of the Prophet Just a salah. For a month, my advice, don't pray any additional voluntary prayers. Start with the obligatory salah. Pray it early, pray it on time, take your time. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Lunch break at work, maybe you get 30 minutes for lunch, 45 minutes for lunch, 10 minutes, 15 minutes salah. Book a room, find a place, find a corner, get rid of the distractions. Make this the most important part of your day. Try doing this for a month, just focusing on the five daily prayers. No more, no less. When you get to this level, then you add a new habit, the 12 sunan. The Prophet ﷺ in some narrations, 12, some narrations 14, sunan. Sunnah, voluntary prayers that he would pray every single day. In the Hanafi Madhid, these are the sunnah mu'akkad, the emphasized sunnah. Once you complete this, then the next level, the night prayer. The duha prayer. But don't try to raise to the end straight away. Build it like a building, like a foundation. One by one, one by one, until you get to a place where you can manage many things at once. Talking about the sunan, the sunnah prayers of the Prophet I said the first principle of the Prophet's worship. What was the first principle of the Prophet's worship? Anybody remember? Qiyam al was the first worship I mentioned, but the first qa'ida, the first principle, if we want to emulate his worship. Quality over quantity. Inward, more important than what's happening outside. Okay, this is the first. The second principle, the principle of consistency. The principle of consistency. The Prophet ﷺ says in famous hadith, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ قَلْ the most beloved, these to Allah are consistent even if they are small. One day, Al-Qama, radiallahu anhu, he asks Aisha, radiallahu anha, the Prophet's wife, he says, Ya Ummal Mu'mineen, O mother of the believers, Kayfa kana amalu Rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was the Prophet's deeds like? His actions, what did they look like? Did he have some days for some special things, some other days for other special things? She said, no. She says this famous word. His actions were consistent. He would do something, he'd do it every day of his life. And this is where the concept of the wird comes in. You might have heard this word, the wird. Wird in Arabic <coughs> refers to a portion. A portion of the Quran or a portion of dhikr that you never leave every day. What does consistency mean? There's a really good, you know, we'll come to that in a moment. How do you build a habit? 
What does consistency mean? It means this action, this habit is so important in my life. If I miss it, I will compensate for it. I will make it up later. So if the Prophet ﷺ would miss his sunnah, his 12 sunnah, and the 12 sunnahs he would pray every day, or 14 depending on which narration you take, he would make them up later. If he missed the night prayer, he would make it up, make it up in the daytime. Because these are his habits. These are the pillars of his day. They never change. They never move. They never sway. This is consistency. When you do something consistently, you start to realize on a daily basis, you won't see the effect. But there's a compound effect. See, every mountain starts with a pebble. One pebble, another pebble, another, before you realize it's a mountain. The Prophet ﷺ, this is how his worship would be. Small, but consistent. So when we want to copy, embody, emulate the Prophet ﷺ, we have to start with something small that we can do. We have to be realistic. The Prophet ﷺ says, when he's giving advice about this, he says, إِكْلِفُوا مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ مَا تُطِيقُونَ Take on board deeds that you are actually realistically able to do. فَلَنْ يَمَلَّ اللَّهَ حَتَّى تَمَلُّوا Allah doesn't get bored, but you might get bored. Don't overdo it. So start with once a week. You can do once a week, make it twice. You can do twice, make it three times, four times. Hold yourself to account. But how do we build consistent habits? This is a deeper question and it applies to all aspects of life. How do you build a consistent habit? There's a book I can recommend to all of you. There's two books. One is a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I'm not saying Sheikh Al-Islam James Clear. You say, Ustad Hisham takes from the kuffar. Yes, I take from the kuffar. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Hikmatu Dalatul Mu'min. Wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever he finds it, he is more deserving of it. If I find wisdom, useful, beneficial knowledge from a non-Muslim, I will take it. And so sometimes we have to accept and benefit from other sources. James Clear, he writes a brilliant book very recently called Atomic Habits. So all on this idea, how do I develop a habit? How do I make something from a deed once in a while? We've all tried it. Ramadan, everybody has the habit of Qur'an. After Ramadan, you know, it's gone. It evaporates. The most effective way to build a habit is to create a sense of accountability. I'll give you a simple example. Someone, everyone says, I want to memorize the Qur'an. I say, great. Pay a teacher, not a friend, pay somebody an amount every week. And let it be someone who you have, you are scared of. You don't want to disappoint them. You respect. And make a fixed weekly time when you have to meet them. And give strict rules to yourself. Say, look teacher, if I come 10 minutes late, cancel the lesson and make me still pay for it. If I miss four lessons in a row, never talk to me again. Tell me to get lost, finish. Creating this accountability, consequences, punishment if you miss it, weekly time, Creating this whole system, this will force you to turn up every week. Even if you are the laziest person in the world, you will turn up because you're scared of the consequences. This is an example. What about the night prayer? How can I create a system for the night prayer? One of the ways to do this is the power of jama'ah. Alone, there's very little you can accomplish. But when we do things in groups, we're able to accomplish much more. You create a WhatsApp group. It's called the Qiyamul Layl crew. The A team. The Muzammil team. Whatever you want. Be creative. What's the deal of this group? All of us are going to choose one night in the week to pray Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer. And if we all succeed in doing so, there is a reward, a group reward. We will each pay 20 pounds into this pot every month. And we will get a reward for all of us. Or we'll go out for a meal. Or we'll have some celebration or something. But we have one goal. One goal only. We want to be the people. When everybody's asleep, we are standing. When everybody's laughing, we are crying. That we have this depth of connection to Allah. We are the people of the night prayer. You create this group. You create this accountability. Everybody's asking the other. You make pairs. You say, look, Ahmed, at 3 a.m., you have to ring me. And if I don't wake up, there is a consequence. I have to give 100 pounds in charity the next day. 
If I don't wake up, there's some consequence on me. Ahmed rings you, you will be awake like there's no, no, no business. This is the reason why, if, if I give you a real life example, this is the reason why many people, they will not wake up for Fajr. One hour later, they'll be up at 8 a.m. for work. Why? What's the difference? Allah and your boss. Why we would wake up for our boss, but we're not waking up for Allah? Because there's accountability. We don't wake up at 8 for our boss, we lose the paycheck. We lose our career, we lose our job, we become, we seen as unprofessional. Maybe they'll strike us off, maybe they'll give us some, a slap on the wrist. So, scared of the consequence, nobody, everybody's up at 8 a.m. Look at the rush hour traffic at 8 a.m. Look at the rush hour traffic at Fajr time, there's no rush hour. Because there's no accountability in this world. Create some self, if you do not have the fear of Allah, the love of Allah, that engine to move you to pray at night, create a system that will force you. A friend, a partner, a teacher, a group, something that will force you to worship Allah. Whether it's reading a page a day of the Quran, whether it's praying the night prayer, creating a system where somebody else is going to hold you to account, this is what will help you succeed. And if it's learning Arabic or recitation of the Quran, or a daily dua, or adhkar, it always helps to do it in a group. It always helps to have a teacher, somebody you fear, somebody you respect. There are parts of the world in which this system has worked wonders. For example, Morocco. In Morocco, many of the masajid, every day at Fajr and Maghrib, they read one hizb of the Quran together. That's half a juz. So every day, all you need to do is turn up. You turn up, you sit down, 20 minutes you leave, you've read half, 10 pages of the Quran. Start at the end of your day. Of course, there's discussions between ulama, between scholars, a valid difference of opinion, whether we can recite the Quran in unison or not, etc., etc. But that's beside the point. Point is, when there's a group doing something, it becomes a culture, it becomes a habit. We'll give you another example from the Horn of Africa, from Bilad al Somal. Many people wonder, what is the secret what is the secret behind the Somali households producing huffaz like the Asian households produce sweets and gulab jamun? What's the secret? The Somali brothers say, someone's going to tell me there is something, a system, a daily system that keeps them revising the Quran in groups. What's it called? Subah. You heard it right. What is this system? What, 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 do, you, what do you guys do? Tell us the secret. We are masakeen, we need something like this. Tell us, what's the secret? Mm. You sit in a circle. Everyone recites one ayah. Okay, perfect. So you read, everybody recites one ayah every day. And this culture exists in many, many households from a young age. Imagine you're a three-year-old and you wake up every morning and all of your older siblings are sitting around your parents reciting one ayah each, one ayah each until the whole family recited 10 pages of the Qur'an. Imagine this was your lifestyle, this was your culture. Your family will grow up loving the Qur'an, having that system of accountability with the Qur'an. When everybody sat in a circle, it's easy to join in. But if you need to, on your own, with all your distractions, do it by yourself, you'll probably forget. So it's really important. So these systems are there embedded in many cultures, many Muslim countries. And we need to revive these and embed them in our lives. A circle of dhikr, a circle of qiyamul layl, a WhatsApp group for revision of the Qur'an. A daily time we come together, we sit and we complete this thing that we want to become, make a daily habit. James Clare wrote his book like two years ago. But the Moroccans and the Somalis were doing atomic habits from 700 years. Let's not, you know, let's not mince our words. These guys are late to the party. We've been developing habits since before their grandparents were born. So it's important to revive this system, how to develop a habit. The Prophet's deeds were consistent. And the way this consistency was preserved was through halaqat, through teachers, through systems that would force you to do it even on a day you don't feel like it. Because everybody else is there. And so you need to turn up as well. We talked about the Prophet's salah. We talked about developing habits, consistent habits. What was the one act of worship that the Prophet ﷺ would be doing all day? Busy or not busy? 
hungry or not hungry, alone or in a group, the dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah. The remembrance of Allah, nobody has any excuse not to remember Allah. In hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّهُ لَيُغَانُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِي وَإِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ فِي الْيَوْمِ مِئَةِ مرة. I want you to pay attention to the first half of what he said. The Prophet ﷺ is sat in a gathering with his colleagues, with his friends, with his companions. And his lips keep moving. What are you saying, O Prophet of Allah? I'm saying, he says, I'm saying, Astaghfirullah wa atubu O oh Allah, forgive my sins. They said, why are you asking Allah to forgive your sins when they've been already forgiven? And he says, Innahu layughanu ala qalbi. I feel a sense of cloudiness in my heart. I feel a something, I feel far from Allah in my heart. Some distance from Allah. Some unease. Because I get busy with things. Somebody comes to complain to me. Somebody, two people are, one murdered the other, they come, I have to judge between them. Somebody wants to come and attack Medina, I have to organize a military response. I get busy. And when I do those things, I miss remembering Allah. I miss Allah. Such that my heart feels the weight of those other things. Everything in this world that distracts us from Allah is there for a reason. Is to make us miss Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're busy at work. You're typing. You're lifting. You're driving. Whatever you're doing. You're busy with your children. Looking after them. Cleaning nappies. Teaching. Running after them. Cooking. All of these activities are acts of worship. But as we do them, something in our heart should be crying out saying, When is the next salah coming? I can't wait to taste that moment of remembrance of Allah. And when that moment comes to sit and say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. The Prophet ﷺ used to say, Astaghfirullah, a hundred times. Later on, one of his companions, Abu Huraira, became known for something. He said, if, if the Prophet Muhammad says it a hundred times, and his deeds are forgiven, and I have millions of sins, then I have got to do a lot more Astaghfirullah than he did. Anybody know how many times a day Abu Huraira used to say, Astaghfirullah? Where is the Shaybani crew, Sheikh Shaybani students? Huh? Not 1,000. Not 10,000. Okay, you went too far. Not 30,000 either. 12,000 times a day. Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, the greatest narrator, the one who's narrated the greatest number of ahadith, used to say, Astaghfirullah, 12,000 times a day. I'm not trying to scare you. You can start at 100. It'll take you three minutes. But here's a tip. Remember, the action of the heart is greater than the action of the tongue. Every time you say Astaghfirullah, remember a sin that you committed. It might have been secret. It might have been public. It might, you might have repented for it. You might have not. Remember that time you gossiped. Remember that time you missed your salah. Remember that time you snapped at your parents. Remember that time. Remember that time. Every time you say Astaghfirullah, feel from the bottom of your heart that regret. Oh Allah, forgive me because only you can forgive my sins. When the Prophet ﷺ gives an advice to Abdullah bin Mas'ud, especially the young companions of his, he would say, لا يزال لسانك رطبا بذكر الله. Keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. You could be the busiest surgeon in the world. You know, once, I used to play sport competitively. I say I used to. If you see me now, you'll cry. Jazakumullah khairan. The brothers from Sweden are thanking for the support from the masjid today. Barakallahu feekum, akramakumullah. Hayakumullah, bayakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you a safe journey. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place barakah in your efforts and your masjid. Amin al I used to play sports competitively. Of course, as you can see, not anymore. Now the sport I play is ilm. Allahu Akbar. So one of my coaches, I used to play cricket. One of my coaches, subhanallah, he was somebody always in a state of dhikr. And this shows you the importance of Muslims being experts and being professionals in different fields. Because when you find a Muslim in that field, Muslim trying to be, trying to work in consulting, or Muslim trying to be a dentist, and you are there, you can teach them how to do this job while doing dhikr of Allah. He said to me, every time you flick the ball in the air, 
say subhanallah. He said, Ajib, he's supposed to teach me how to play. He's teaching me how to do dhikr. And he said to me, like this, if you say subhanallah or bihamdi 1,000 times, you'll always be the best player on the field. I'll tell you something funny. I laughed at him at that time. Every time I followed his advice, and my whole, the whole, you know, cricket matches are very long, not like 90 minutes football. We play for nine hours. Nine hours. Every time I flick the ball, subhanallah or bihamdi. Those matches were the best performance I ever had in my, in my lifetime. It is proven. It is proven. Empirically, statistically, and through the promise of Allah. Nothing enhances your dunya like the remembrance of Allah. And nothing raises your rank like the remembrance of Allah. Nothing can quell your anxiety and your depression and your difficulties like the remembrance of Allah. And nothing can give you comfort like the remembrance of Allah. Did Allah not say in the Quran, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطَمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ It is only through the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. Very important for us to reflect every morning and evening the Prophet Sallallahu It is differed exactly what time. He would select a time after Fajr, before the sunrise, and a time after Asr, before the sunset. He would select a time to unwind from his day through the remembrance of Allah. These are the adhkar of morning and evening. There's a really good app on the app store called the Dhikr and Dua app by Life with Allah. Dhikr and Dua app by Life with Allah. Open this app tomorrow or today. Go to the morning remembrance, adhkar of the morning. Or maybe you're driving to work. Go to YouTube, search adhkar of morning, morning remembrance. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Just play while you drive. Subhanallah wa bihamdih, hundred times. La ilaha illallah, hundred times. Ayatul kursi, the three quls. These, this is the fuel for your day. Even if you had no breakfast, I'm telling you, don't believe the doctors, believe the spiritual doctors. Even if you had no breakfast, and you're running on no fuel, the remembrance of Allah will get you across the line. If you try this habit, try from tomorrow, one minute in the morning and evening, do the remembrance of Allah on your way to work, on your back from work. In the morning before your children wake up after Fajr, and in the evening once they go to sleep, if you're, if you're a parent, you're a mother, one minute of the dhikr of Allah with your focus. And you tell me, if you did not feel an effect in your day, come to me, I will give you a refund on your time. I can't give you a refund on your time, sorry. The dhikr of Allah in the morning and evening, and the dhikr of Allah throughout the day, is the greatest game changer in the worship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if only we implemented it in our lives. One of the greatest forms of reflection, of dhikr of Allah and fear of Allah, worship of Allah, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would practice. Ibn Abi Hala radiallahu anhu narrates, كان رسول الله, رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم متواصل الأحزان دائم الفكرة ليست له راحة This is an act of worship that's not physical. You can't see it. You can't perceive it. You can't observe it. No, it's not magic. It's not سحر. Something else. Ibn Abi Hala رضي الله عنه, رضي الله عنه narrates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to always, he used to be in constant thought, always thinking. Al-fikr. To constantly be thinking about Allah, constantly be thinking about the Ummah, constantly be thinking, how can I serve Allah? Laysat lahu raha. He would not take a break. You know the idea of the weekend? You know who invented the idea of the weekend? The Industrial Revolution. When the Industrial Revolution came, a human being's schedule was developed and designed to, to work in a factory. Where do you think three meals a day came from? We didn't used to eat three meals a day. Ask, ask your grandparents, your great grandparents. Nobody used to eat three meals a day. It came from the Industrial Revolution. 30 minutes of breakfast, 30 minute lunch, 30 minute dinner, and then you go home. 12 hours you're sat in the factory doing the same thing again and again. Where did the idea of the weekend came? Somebody's going to be in a factory five days a week, they need two days of rest, otherwise they become useless. One of my mashayikh used to tell me, when I used to see him, Qiyamul Layl every day, Adhkar every day, constantly helping people, the Quran, constant, constant. I used to say to him, when do you rest? He used to say to me, Ar-Rahatu fil Jannah. I will rest in Jannah. <laughs> That's my weekend. We can rest from our day job, but there's no rest from the remembrance of Allah. In fact, the remembrance of Allah is our rest. 
And if it's not, something's wrong with us. When the Prophet ﷺ would get stressed, he would say to Bilal, Arihna biha ya Bilal, Bilal, give me some relaxation, please. Call the, call, call the adhan. I need to relax. The salah was his rest. Dhikr was his weekend. That was his high. That was his, his recuperation. That was his recovery after a difficult day. It was the remembrance of Allah. But there is an act of worship of the Prophet ﷺ that was constant, that many of us do not are not able to do today. It is the act of worship called reflection. At tafakkur. You might be sat. You might be at work. You might be a surgeon looking inside someone's lungs. And while you're looking inside their lungs, you think how amazing and detailed is the creation of Allah. You are doing dhikr. You might be driving a taxi and you pick up a new customer. And they sit in the back completely drunk in the middle of the night and you say, what a great blessing, Allah absolved me from the test of alcohol. You are in remembrance of Allah. You might be a parent with difficult children and you're running around with them, picking up their pieces and you stand up to pray salah and your little child comes and follows you and jumps into sujood. And you think, how great is the blessing of Allah that even the purity of a child's heart brings them to salah. You are in fikr, at tafakkur. At tafakkur to reflect, to contemplate. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Tafakkaru fi ala illahi wa la tafakkaru fi Allah. Think deeply about Allah's creation, but do not think too deeply about Allah himself. Because you can never comprehend Allah fully. Allah is the infinite, you are the limited. But you think for a moment, the Prophet sallallahu received revelation in a cave. What was he doing in the cave? Was he reciting Quran? There was no Quran. Was he remembering Allah? He didn't know what to say to remember Allah. Was he making dua? He was not making, what was he doing in the cave? He was just thinking. Aisha radiallahu anha described, she says, khala. He used to love to spend time by himself with Allah. Allah Akbar. Khala. According to the sociologist, psychologist today, you know when is the only time a man sits on his own with no distractions? Akramakumullah, when he sits in the toilet. When you sit in the toilet three minutes, this is the only time in the whole day you have no distractions. Can you imagine how low we have become as a race? How destroyed we are on the inside. For us to sit alone with no distractions, we have to be answering the call of nature. But you know what? Those psychologists are outdated because today we will never do this. But if we were to put a CCTV in the toilet, you would see that 80% of the people on the toilet are also using their phones. And this is something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to many scholars, is either offensive or prohibited. It's either makruh or haram. Because when you go into that zone, you should be not doing nothing except answering the call of nature. But you know why people tend to take their phone out? Because there's no other time of the day they get a moment to themselves. So they hide there. So now if somebody goes for a toilet break, you find them after 25 minutes. Sheikh? Were you inventing a sewage system? Or were you relieving yourself? This is an actual problem in management. In, in professional workplaces, in the corporate world, this is an actual problem. It's studied in HR. The toilet breaks have become so long that you actually wonder, did you need to send a search party out for the person. Where did they go? We need to send a helicopter after them. Where have they disappeared? 45 minute toilet break. Why? We have to understand what's happening in the human brain. So many notifications, so many distractions, so many things happening. The only time you find khalwa, a moment to yourself, is when you're relieving the call of nature. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and protect us, rectify our condition. This is the role salah is supposed to play. It is supposed to be play the role of the reliever. The role of the moment that you find yourself alone with Allah. But what happens? Allahu Akbar. All of the to-do list starts to come. All the things you didn't do start to come in your mind. This is what happens to all of us. What it requires, one minute before salah, one minute to close your eyes and to remember that I'm standing in front of Allah. One minute. And even to have a paper before Salah, write down all the to-do list, all of the stresses, write it down on a paper, done. I don't have to worry about it now. Allahu Akbar. Get it out of your head. Put it somewhere else where you don't have to think about it. 
And so coming back to the point, the idea of tafakkur, to reflect, to be someone who is thinking all the time, to think of Allah, to connect things back to Allah. This is one of the greatest and deepest acts of worship of the Prophet The Prophet Sallallahu relationship with the Qur'an There were certain surahs of the Qur'an that was beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Or he would men- recite them at certain times Or he would give them special attention Or he'd mention them in a special light Can anybody give me some examples? Huh? Surah Al-Muzzammil Az-Zumar what, did, what was his relationship with Az-Zumar? He would, according to some narrations, he would recite it at night before sleeping. Any other surahs? Yes? <laughs> Surah Al-Mulk, it is narrated he would recite Surah Al-Mulk before his sleep. Surah Al-Kahf, it is reported he would recite Surah Al-Kahf every Friday. Surah Yasin, it comes in a Tirmidhi that Yasin is the heart of the Quran and its authenticity is disputed. Yes? Surah Al-Waqi'ah, when would he recite Surah Al-Waqi'ah? Specific time, specific place? You're not sure, okay. There's something wider than Waqi'ah. Waqi'ah is a group of surahs. Yes. Go on, tell me the hadith. Correct. There are some surahs which the Prophet ﷺ would recite to remind himself of the fear of Allah and the Day of Judgment. He said, Shayyabatni hudun wa akhawatuha. Surah Hud and its sisters have made my hair go gray. Meaning they have terrified me. So he would have a special attachment to these surahs. He would recite them often. Waqi'ah is one of the surahs. Anything else? You had your hand up? Okay, yes. In salah, some particular salahs, he would recite particular surahs. In the sunnah before fajr, the two units of prayer before fajr, he would recite, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ and قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ Why? What's the link between these two surahs? Yes. After Maghrib as well. This, these two surahs are, is the most concise summary of the oneness of Allah. Go read the translation and reflect on them. Yes? So, in the Fajr prayer on Friday, Surah Al-Sajda and Surah Al-Insan. Why? Always ask why. Why this surah? Why this day? The Prophet says about Friday, Sorry, he would say about Friday, this is the day Adam was created. What does Surah Al-Insan remind you of? The creation of the human being. And what does Surah Al-Sajda remind you of? Go and you go back to Sajda and think about it. That's your homework, inshallah. Anything else? Any other specific surah at specific times? On Friday for Jum'ah, Al-Ghashi and Al-A'la. Why al ghashi and Al-A'la? Not just because they're one after the other. What is Surah al ghashi about? The Day of Judgment. What is Surah Al-A'la about? Hmm? We've never, why have we never thought about these things we do every week and every day and every month? Because we are not people of tafakkur. We are not people of reflection. We have become people of empty rituals. Salah has become aerobics. Why? Always ask why. This is the question to ask. Su'al al-Jawhari. Yes. Okay, so Al-A'la describes the personality traits of people who avoid the hellfire. And then Al-Ghashiyah describes the hellfire and describes paradise for you. So what Al-A'la is about the glorification of Allah and the connection to Him. And Al-Ghashiyah is about what happens if you don't glorify Him in your life. You will find out afterwards what happens. Any other surah pairs? Al-Jumu'ah Al-Munafiqoon. He would recite Al-Jumu'ah and Al-Munafiqoon in Jumu'ah. And he would recite it sometimes in other salawat. This pair. Look at the pairs that he would recite with and ask yourself why these pa- this pair. Look at the times of day. 
So to, some salawat he would prolong and some salawat he would shorten. Who can tell me which salah would he shorten? Okay. Salatul Maghrib. Why? Always ask this question. Why? Yes. The window of Salatul Maghrib is quite small. And which salah would he prolong? Salatul Fajr and Salatul Isha. And he also says, what is the sign of a hypocrite? Which salah do they find difficult? Fajr and Isha. Think, it's all connected. Somebody had their hand up just now. Brother, you had your hand up. Yes. Baqarah and Ali Imran, which he would recite in the night prayer, or he would recite sometimes in Isha time. Baqarah and Ali Imran. All of it. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you one day to recite Baqarah and Ali Imran in one rakah. Say Ameen. Ameen, Rabbil Ameen. Don't worry, it'll be easy, piece of cake for you. But you have to first memorize the Quran upon the Somali method. Then it will be like flowing waterfall, inshallah. Don't worry. It's very important to realize there's a wisdom behind the surahs he would pick. It's almost like he had a companionship, a closeness with particular surahs. Particular times of day, some were emphasized more than the other. Al-Mulk at night, because as you go to sleep, you want to remember that everything is the kingdom of Allah. And as I sleep, I may never wake up again. That's what Surah Al-Mulk is about. Everything is the kingdom of Allah. I am just one piece of this kingdom. Al-Jumu'ah Al-Munafiqoon on Friday to remind us about Jumu'ah, the importance of Jumu'ah, the context of Jumu'ah. And Al-Munafiqoon to remind us, you could go to Jumu'ah, like many people, we call them Jumu'ah Muslims. You could go to Jumu'ah, I'm doing an empty ritual. And then what happens? This is what the life of hypocrites was. They would do empty rituals without understanding what they were doing. Yes. Falaq an nas When would he recite Falaq, Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas? Sorry? After Maghrib, after morning and evening adhkar, but specifically for what purpose? Sorry? Protection, ar-ruqya. Please do not pay anyone 150 pounds to come to your house, plug in a speaker, and please do not pay anybody one pound to come to your house and scream. And then somebody is doing a dance and like, you know, please do not. Do not pay anybody to do this. Why? The Prophet ﷺ said, the greatest ruqya, the greatest means of protection is قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And the greatest form of self-protection is to recite it yourself, upon yourself. Now someone came to me last week, in the masjid, another masjid, not this masjid, don't worry guys, you don't have to find who this person. He said, look, he took out this necklace, you know I've been having sicknesses, cancer, bowel pains, I went to this mufti in this country, in this village, he gave me this this necklace to wear, he still put it, and since then I'm better. I said, brother, come, let's open the necklace. He opens the necklace, there's a piece of paper, open the piece of all these numbers and squiggly lines. I said, brother, probably his son was one day scribbling on the paper, and he decided to squiggle and write some numbers. He folded it and he gave it to you and he made some money from you. It's called placebo effect. It's all in your head. The paper did nothing for you. This is, this is become, we've become superstitious people. And we have expanded the realm and the power of jinn more than Allah gave them power. And we have given this whole industry of ruqya. It has created kawarith. So many problems. And I'm tired. Now when people come, they say, please ruqya. I say, do you know falaq an nas? Yes. Recite it please on yourself, by yourself. And do you think I have some superpower? I have some special powers? If I scream into a microphone, choo choo, you're all going to get fine. Because why? Because I'm close to Allah. Believe me, if you knew how close I was to Allah, how far I am from Allah, you would run away from me. Why don't you just recite falaq? Is it not the same Allah who is going to relieve you of this problem? What's the difference between you and me? Ruqya is not a specialism. It's not a takhassus. There's no master's PhD degree in Ruqya. There's no ijazah in Ruqya. No sahaba said, that's a sahaba to go for fatwa. That's the sahaba to narrate hadith. And that's the sahaba to give you protection. That never happened. You want protection? The Prophet ﷺ says, one of the signs of the people who will enter paradise without hisab or adab, no accountability and no punishment, 
هُمُ الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ They don't ask anyone else to protect them. They ask Allah's protection. Allah is protecting you. Not piece of paper. Not some, some guy screaming into a speaker. Please end this culture today. Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas. When it was revealed on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That night, he told his companion, he told Aisha radiallahu anha, the greatest surahs for protection was revealed tonight. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ You need nothing else because you only need رَبُّ الْفَلَقْ The Lord of the daybreak. مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ To protect you from the evil of what he created. That's what the surah is about. That's all you need. You don't need anybody else. Sorry, it was, I had kept it in for a long time. I waited. Today was the day it all came out. I'm sorry you were subject to it. Please end this culture of paying people of saying this so-and-so is a Ruqya specialist, and you're gonna come and scream in the microphone and make some special papers and do some shoo, 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 shoo. You know, because I come from a village, a lot of these are Hindu practices and superstitions which have blended in to Islam, and they are not from Islam. I come from a culture and I come from a village in South India, where if you move into a new house, you pay the Raqi a huge sum of money, they come to your house, they pour milk in a bowl, they blow in the bowl, they do some abracadabra with the bowl. Now your house is protected. Ya Shabab. What is this? This is a circus? One time I caught one of them. I caught one, Maulana. I said, Maulana, this is my auntie's house. You came here, you're rubbing the wall. What are you doing? You want some paint on your hands? What is this? He says, Hadihi baraka. I said, Sheikh, where did you get this baraka from? Where can I get it from as well? He said, this is from Allah. I said, good, maybe we can just ask him directly. You know, direct connection. We don't need to go through you and through your, your abracadabra on the walls and your jumping up and down and rubbing the floor and putting some, something in the food. Ya Sheikh, what is this? Then he said to me, look, I need to make a living. <laughs> we all have to make a living. So, you know, when is your flight back? <sighs> so please end this superstition. The worship of Allah, ultimately, the protection, our ruqya, it comes from Allah. And we seek it from Him, and He gives it to us, and we turn to Him. And the greatest sign of someone who trusts Allah is somebody who asks Him directly, not through any other means or any other persons, etc., etc. So we don't go to divert from the message. The worship of the Prophet ﷺ, the first principle it starts from within, within the heart. If the heart is not connected to Allah, nothing you do outside matters. It will be weak, it will be dead, it will be empty. Number two, the principle of consistency. Small deeds that are consistent. How do you develop a habit? Number three, you need accountability. A group, a teacher, somebody else to hold you accountable so you can develop this and it becomes a culture. Number four, the most, the act of worship the Prophet ﷺ would do all day consistently throughout the day, no matter what he was doing, was the, the remembrance of Allah. And number five, the, the worship of Allah that he would do, that many of us don't do anymore, is the worship of tafakkur, to think about Allah. To think why. Always ask the question why. Why did the Prophet do this? To have special relationship with surahs of the Quran. To recite them frequently. To spend time with them. To taste them. Try it once to pray salah in just one ayah. Repeating it again and again. An ayah that you love to recite. Yes. The, the issue that stops people from contemplating our brother's thing is the phone. I have a solution for all of you. I am getting no commission. Wallah, Allah is a witness. If I got commission, I'd be happy. This phone, my dear brothers, is called the Nokia 2720 flip phone. It has data. It has WhatsApp. But if you want to type, yeah, you don't, you're going to be so sick of typing, you won't type. You can receive calls. You can make calls. Say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. This phone, you can ask my parents and my siblings. When I switched to this phone, they all said, it's a Hisham version 2.0. <laughs> yes, it's harder for people to get a hold of me, but they know if they send. I have WhatsApp in my laptop. When, you know, I will respond within 72 hours, three working days. <laughs> no problem. But if you need me, you'll call me, I will call you back. And this phone allowed me to concentrate again. 
allowed me to focus again, allowed me to read without interruptions, allowed me to sit on a hill and look at the creation of Allah without hearing ting, ting, ting. This, this subhanAllah, sometimes we have to take the means are very important and this means will help you. What you can try to start with to build the habit, you take a phone like this, one day a week you put your SIM card in this phone. Let's say for example Jum'ah. Say Jum'ah is my cave day. If someone needs me, they can call me, but today is no WhatsApp day. It's the day for me to go early to Jum'ah. Remember Allah, recite Suratul Kahf, dua time before Maghrib. I'm going to do all these things. I'm not going to be distracted. One day a week. One day, one day. Eventually you will say, that day is so beautiful. Maybe I can do it every day. Build the habit slowly. In, you know, sometimes we need some devices to go into the cave. So this is important tips, inshallah. وصلي اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Next week is the last lesson. And don't miss it, inshallah. May Allah grant us, allow us to gather in this world and in the hereafter. If there's any questions, I will stay once the live stream is off. Inshallah, we can answer these questions.